Jürgen is not the kind of manager you show a spreadsheet to. That's not the way to get him excited. But he understood what the expertise was and the benefit it was bringing to the club. He believes in expertise. And he also believes as the leader of an organisation, he doesn't have the time or the bandwidth to watch every player in Europe to decide who we're going to sign, to understand from a training point of view how to get the players in peak physical condition. So he's happy to delegate that out yeah. to the experts. So he knew what the data department did he knew the impact we had on recruitment so how did you get him excited so um he's a very emotional person in, in a good way uh, he loves a story about as we all do a story about the players and that story goes alongside some video work on the players so managers tend to be visual thinkers um my colleagues in the video analysis and video scouting departments were really good at crystallising the strengths and weaknesses of players into a 30-minute presentation that came with a narrative over it. And it wasn't a narrative that said, you know, the data has shown he's created 25% chance of a goal from this situation. Uh, but then on the defensive side, he does allow a little bit more danger to happen. And that's a 5% extra chance of conceding a goal. It's, you know, when you think about wide forward play, you need your wide forward to cut inside. Here's the clips that say that. Uh, and things to worry about this player, here are the defensive clips where... He doesn't track back as much. And then it's Jürgen's job to say, I believe I can make him track back. <laughs> so would you take us then to uh, a moment where maybe Jürgen Klopp had a certain player in mind. You looked at the data and actually recommended a different player and how, how that process worked from you looking at the raw data, compiling things, going to Jürgen and then eventually convincing this this man who, you know, to the outside world is the leader of that football club. So it kind of rests on his shoulders, yeah. right? How did you convince him to go with your decision, not his? Yeah, I think it's important to say it's our decision. Yeah. So as I, I talk about in the book, um, data is only ever one part of the um, story with a player. Um, video tells you still today, even with the much greater depth of data we've got, video tells you things that you can't see in the data. Um, like what, for example? So tracking data is where you see the trajectories of all 22 players on the pitch, uh, but it's just one point per player. So you don't know if they're back to goal, facing goal. You don't know if they're making a kicking action. You don't know if they're lying on the ground. So from the data, you say, well, why didn't he why didn't he cover that run? It's like, well, he was lying on the floor. He'd just been right. fouled. The data doesn't see some of those things. You can infer it from the data. And data is getting, uh, you know, the next generation of tracking data does tell you all that stuff. Um, you know, body language, things that coaches find important that I pay no importance to as a, as a data scientist. Um, yeah, all the soft, it's wrong to call it soft, but uh, Jürgen had this no assholes policy. Um, and so, you know, finding out what's this person like yeah. before deciding to spend a large amount of money on them. And were there players you would have recommended that he then investigated and actually he decided that culturally they, they wouldn't fit? Yeah, it's always, um, so, you know, one of the side effects of having um, data function at a club is uh, you come a we had a website with a list of players on it and I'd ne I always suggest not doing this, but you can rank them from best to worst and then just look down the list. So you look at the best young players and think, so it's typically on, oh, on loan from Chelsea, on loan from Manchester City and you keep going down the list like, this guy in the Spanish second division looks amazing. I've never heard of this guy. So you have a little look on the video as well. So sort of uh, um, say to the scouting department, what about this guy? Yeah, we know him well, terrible habits, very unprofessional, he's just not going to succeed at the club. Yeah. That's not to say people can't change, but there's kind of like a hidden risk. That... It's interesting. So that's why a player of that quality would be in that league and not being used because other people have also seen perhaps the same, the same trend. Yeah, yeah, maybe so, maybe so. Where does the sort of psychological profiling then take place? Yeah, there's the, there's not so much science and data behind that, but we had um, staff in the scouting department and also uh, Michael would pay a lot of attention to that psychological side because you can put a lot of weight on character, like yeah. um, the, the makeup of personalities in the squad. He liked um, 
fighters. Well, I, I was going to say he liked winners. He didn't like winners. He liked fighters that would sort of give their all to win, whether they won or lost. It would be secondary to the attitudes that you bring. Could you find data that would validate whether somebody was a fighter or not? Uh, it's it's hard uh, because you can you can say well okay when the team's one nil down um, this player's performances are better but to say is that repeatable and is that because he's a fighter and if he was a fighter maybe they wouldn't have gone one nil down in the first place right so um, so you know the data certainly paints a picture and you can put a narrative behind it but you have to be very careful about hygiene to say this is what the data says to assign a psychological narrative to that is, sure. is dangerous. But was there any character point, so where you felt the data gave you a clear uh, line of sight from a certain characteristic that a manager might like? And you could say, well, this evidence gives us some pretty uh, robust data that that is exactly who he is. Yeah, I think, again, it's like some data can suggest those things, like availability, for example, of um, you know being fit, well, this physically robust, but mentally robust is part of that as well. Sure. Um, and we can do analysis on this to say, you know, this guy for availability is ninetieth percentile um, in big games. This player always performs to his level or above his level, and not below his level. And you could interpret that. I'm, I'm not a psychologist, so yeah. I can't give an explicit <clears throat> answer because I don't know if it's valid or not, to say, ah, it's because he's a fighter, yeah, sure. it's because he's got a great character. But the reason I ask Ian is that I'm reminded as you're talking about some of these character traits that one of Alex Ferguson's great demands of his players was, he said, I want players that are courageous, and mm. in his definition is the guy that's demanding the ball when we're getting beat 1-0 rather than the guy that wants it only when we're 3-0 up and coasting. So the, 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 there must be some data that would give you evidence of, of yeah. courage, for example. Yeah, so, I mean, a good example of that, so, you know, involvement, if your involvement is low, that kind of says you're not on the ball. Now, there might be, if you're on a low possession team, you need to adjust for these things and do a rigorous analysis of it. Um, so not being involved very much, you know, you could sort of say that's not the sort of player we want. Um, the courageous point is something that the analysis can... Uh, point to so I talk in the book about um, pass completion percentages yep. and if you make an easy pass back to the goalkeeper your completion percentage is going to be high uh, and again Jürgen liked the risk taking players might okay. have a much lower pass completion percentage if you're trying a difficult pass that's going to break a line or going to create a chance of course it's going to be less likely to succeed the question is are you outperforming if you're making those passes six times out of ten whereas our current player only makes them five times out of ten your six out of ten is better than my ten out of ten which is all back to the goalkeeper and so that sort of um that speaks somewhat to bravery on the ball yep. um you're not going to draw me on tying it directly to psychology, but it's all it all paints a picture. Yeah, of course. Would you be willing to take us into a time where you saw a player, you recommended a player, everything said this player is going to work, and actually the truth is that life isn't as simple as that? Uh, yeah. Let's be honest. Parenthood gives you the highest highs and the lowest lows. It can drain you, it can challenge you, it can push you to your limits, your time, your energy, your focus, it's all gone. And how often do you feel like you're just running on empty? And then it's so hard to show up and be that parent that you really want to be. And high performance, by the way, isn't just about big wins. It isn't about victories. It's about showing up consistently for the people and the things that matter the most. And that is why I take vitals from Heights. This is just two capsules. You take them once a day and it's got omega-3, all the B vitamins, I and D3, 20 essential nutrients. And what's really important actually for me personally is that I know this is designed by doctors and dietitians. I know it's been tested again and again and again. It takes me seconds to take these capsules, but it gives me that stamina, that focus, that better sleep, that mental clarity that just lasts and lasts. All of the things that I think help me to be the dad that I want to be and not the dad that's so tired he can't play with his kids. Um, and if you don't trust me, maybe you'll trust the science. Um, maybe you'll trust the 120,000 people that take vitals and they take it for a good reason. So if you want to feel sharper, more focused, more in control throughout your day, just go to heights.com slash HP and use the code HP20 
for 20% off or easily just click the link in the description. Uh, yeah, um, Balotelli, we already spoke about. The strange thing with Balotelli was all of this kind of baggage that comes with him. He didn't really misbehave at Liverpool. Um, he was just not really trusted, not given the opportunity. I don't want to sort of say it's all the manager's fault or all Balotelli's fault. He just didn't get the opportunity. He didn't produce at Liverpool in the same way he produced at other clubs. He didn't get on the pitch in the same way that Moding didn't get on the pitch yeah. at Chelsea. He was an unusual case of the data being brilliant on Balotelli. It's like, how is this player available um, for any fee, let alone the fee that Milan wanted? Um, to be fair to Brendan, he wasn't... Um, anti the Balotelli signing. The problem was because we'd argued so much and spent so long trying to get to an agreement on a forwards to sign, it was too late. There was no one left in the market except for Balotelli. Um, and so I think Brendan wasn't necessarily against the signing. But also there was kind of like, there was a ready-made excuse if he fails. It's like, oh, well, it's Balotelli. What did you expect? Which isn't very fair on the yeah. player. Um, I think that was the problem with this compromise approach was kind of we tried it for three years and there was just never any movement so um what do you mean the compromise approach just explain that for people who are kind of so the idea of the transfer committee was like the manager comes with his preferred players so you had a you had a you were part of a transfer yeah. committee at that time yeah right so you got the manager's view the data's view you know the finance and owner's view and then the traditional scouting view as well yeah. that's how it worked with yoga and like nothing changed behind the scenes um and you know if the owner's idea was like wisdom of the crowds. If everyone thinks this is a good idea, the chance of failure is much lower than... But would you all sit together and debate this individual from all those different yeah, perspectives? Yeah, I was okay. I was lucky enough that I think it was only one of those meetings I actually sat in in person. I was like, you know what, I can't sit in any more of these uh, meetings. Because... I, it, was, it was just um, stupid and negative. It was like we just would get nowhere there was no the idea of a committee is you sit down and compromise there's no compromise from the manager's side and that kind of hardened the other side as well so it was just just arguments with no progress and so what and that was because the manager sort of had specific players specific in mind players and the and didn't believe the data that you were bringing him that would say this person is a good alternative yeah what right. what, what happened was um if it if Brendan liked a player that um we also liked, then that was great. We'd just signed that player. Um, I think in Brendan's defence, if you're not convinced, you're the you're the front of house, you have to sort of um, play the player, you have to understand who they are. And if you're not convinced, it's hard. But he could never, I, I think he could never trust in the process that we put in place. So he could only trust his own eyes and his view, not the extra information that was being brought. So he was... Um, uh, you know, Benteke was his favourite forward and we failed to sign Diego Costa because of this argument that went on of, you know, if we're going to sign a forward, it has to be Benteke. He's the player that will yeah. move Liverpool forward. And, and there was never, well, there's there always very little movement until, um, you know, it comes to the end of the transfer window. It's like, well, we haven't signed anyone. Like, yeah. my first choice is gone, your first choice is gone. What's what's left on the table? So, Ian, give us the two most common reasons why uh, the kind of heuristics or objections people will make in order to blind themselves to something so self-evident. Uh, absolute number one is, um, and you know, I you know, I'm a Liverpool fan. That's so when a player plays well against Liverpool. I think they're a great player because you have to be great to play well against Liverpool. A uh, player plays well against you. As a manager in particular, it's really vivid and, you know, you've done everything. And Benteke was, he was brilliant, to get, unstoppable against us. And I was thinking, how can he be so effective against Liverpool? I think he had the highest rate of goals against us in the rest of the league. And it's like, you know, one of the pieces of evidence against him is he doesn't score at this rate against anyone else, just us. But would you then... If he said it's Benteke, would you bring the data that says why it shouldn't be Benteke rather than just the data that says why it should be somebody else? Uh, yes, yeah, is the short answer. So Benteke was a uh, you know target man style striker and we just didn't play with a target man. And 
I did a, a whole um, trawl of European leagues to say, you know, the, the idea was at Liverpool, he wouldn't play in that style. He only played that way because that's the way Villa played. He could become a much more dynamic forward at Liverpool. And again, you, you know, if you have 10 seasons of uh, five leagues of European data, you can, you can ask the question, well, you know, does this happen? So you take all the players who look a similar profile to Benteke, look at all of their transfers, some of them to bigger clubs. Do they change? And the answer was, they didn't change. And so that's not to say he can't change. It's not mm. to say you're wrong, but just to say, looking at the evidence this doesn't happen. So you're banking on something special happening in this case. And again, it, you know, data is never the, never the whole answer with football. Um, but it gives you a benchmark to say, well, you know, how special or how much of an outlier does this have to be for it to work in the way you think it's going to work? Um, and Benteke ended up playing in the same style at Liverpool, which you know, it's not Benteke's fault. It's it's what happens. He scored at a reasonable rate at Liverpool, but just the wrong player in the wrong system. <laughs> <laughs>